All right, good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And today we're talking about concussions and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So <clears throat> here we go. Okay. So starting this discussion, we can't really go too far before we mention the individual who pioneered. Uh, this diagnosis and who deserves a tremendous amount of credit and in my opinion was rather heroic in the way he stood up for what he was observing and so his name is Dr. Omalu he's the the cornerstone so to speak of the movie Concussion if you haven't watched it I recommend you go and watch it because it's a great movie and regardless of your opinions on professional sports and things like that it's a good example of someone who followed their heart and followed their mind in describing something they felt was valid, which also brought a lot of validity to former athletes who were suffering and their lives were in shambles, so to speak, after playing years and years of contact sports. Uh, Dr. Amalo's work has really reframed how we look at contact sports. It has reframed the seriousness of concussions and repetitive head impacts or subconcussive head impacts. And with his work now, we, we give concussions a lot more emphasis, so to speak. So when you've heard me talk about, you know, there really wasn't a lot of literature on concussions um, before the year 2000. I mean, there was literature, of course, but the literature was nothing like it is now. And with Dr. Amal's work, it's forced the large organizations involving contact sports to reevaluate this issue and dedicate a lot of research money to it. And from that, uh, we just have a completely different understanding of mild traumatic brain injury and the brain versus that that was there 30 years ago. And again, it's a natural conclusion for a neurologist you know, through the, the 1990s to say, well, how is it that I see this one patient who has a skull fracture or they have, a, you know, a brain bleed and there's this other individual who, you know, hit their head, they didn't even lose consciousness and their life is ruined. And this person who had a skull fracture or a brain bleed has made a seemingly normal or a full recovery and they're now functioning normally. So that was the prevailing view in neurology until Dr. Omalu who, uh, you know, it's just one of those serendipitous uh, events in human history where he's a neuropathologist and he happens to be the one doing the autopsy on a retired former professional football player who was suffering greatly with memory loss and mood and behavioral disturbance from, from what I could appreciate. And Dr. Amalu really brought justification to his injuries and vindication to his family and then later went on to see several other professional football players who unfortunately passed and he found a similar similar neuropathological lesion in their brain which he named chronic traumatic encephalopathy so this is his first report in the journal of neurosurgery and any of you who want to go back and read it read it but it's a it's a great piece um, and I think it's it's one of those things we're going to read about in textbooks 50 and 100 years from now. So, and then also homage needs to be given to Dr. Ann McKee's group at Boston University. She's doing a lot of the current research on chronic traumatic encephalopathy. She's taken the ball and run with it, pardon the pun. And she also, in my opinion, is a heroine as she continues to stand up for what she's observing. And lots of times these findings are very unpopular and they can have large ramifications for the future of how we handle head injuries in sports. But also Dr. Ann McKee's group is, is now the group doing this. So anyways, you know, those of you who watch my videos, I don't commonly give homage like this, but um, I think it's important and I think if you have spare time, YouTube, Dr. Ann McKee, YouTube, Dr. Omalu, uh, there's some, there's some pretty interesting speakers and, and pretty interesting viewpoints, so to speak. So I'll leave it at that. All right. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy, what is it? CTE 
is this neuropathological lesion where we see hyperphosphorylated tau protein in the perivascular spaces as well as in the sulcal depths. What does that mean? Basically it means most of you know that when somebody has Alzheimer's that their brain is affected. And with Alzheimer's disease, we can have, it's called a neurodegenerative process. I didn't get my coffee this morning. So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative process. There are other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and the Parkinson's plus syndromes. And so we have a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, including you know, frontal temporal dementia. There are all these different conditions which cause the brain to, in essence, atrophy or areas to atrophy, and then we get symptoms. So with Alzheimer's disease, we for sure have atrophy of the memory area and other surrounding areas. <clears throat> we see with Alzheimer's disease, you know, beta amyloid plaques is the hallmark lesion. There is hyperphosphorylated tau seen with Alzheimer's. But what was different that Dr. Malu discovered with chronic traumatic encephalopathy was this hyperphosphorylation of tau particularly in the frontal lobes. And he noticed what I mentioned in the sulcal depths. So here we have the sulci. He noticed deep down in there that there was a lot of tau in a different kind of disbursement than you would see typically with Alzheimer's. And he also saw that, you know, in the perivascular regions as well. So there's kind of a different distribution, so to speak, to this accumulation of tau protein. And what is tau? Tau is, you would think of it as like the two by four, so to speak, of your neuron. So envision the room you're in and envision that that is a neuron. If, you know, you shrunk yourself down considerably smaller and then imagine the two by four is starting to crumple. And that would be analogous to hyperphosphorylation of tau such that, well, and tau is kind of a cytoskeletal protein. So, you know, trafficking of, of molecules to and fro. So imagine some like some cables within this room, and then these cables not being able to traffic things from side to side. That's what happens to your brain when you have hyperphosphorylated tau. Really what that means is that now your brain cells don't work well. So we all know that we can lose a few brain cells, but when you start losing a lot of brain cells and how they're functioning, you're going to start developing symptoms, which is where with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, there seems to be these different manifestations. One of them, the two dichotomous groups seem to be a younger age group where they more have emotional and behavioral symptoms. And then you have an older group that primarily has dementia symptoms. Needless to say, you have younger individuals overall, even the older group, you know, they may be 50 years old and they're demonstrating signs of dementia. Overall, you have this younger group of people who are now manifesting neuro psychological symptoms or memory related symptoms that they shouldn't have. And so in this diagram, let me loosen my tie here. In this diagram, you're going to see this is what a normal brain tissue specimen should look like a cross section. Here these kind of maroon spots relate to in essence hyperphosphorylated tau. They basically this is an antibody to tau protein that immunofluoresces. And so you can see hyperphosphorylated tau here in this illustration C. And again, this is from Annals of Neurology, I believe. Uh, this is one of Dr. McKee's more recent articles. And it's titled Duration of American Football Play in Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. So nonetheless, I wanted to highlight this slide because here this is a mild deposition of tau protein. This is severe deposition of tau protein. This is what Dr. McKee is seeing in the majority of the retired professional football players that she has worked with or, you know, that she has uh, autopsied and evaluated. Because, again, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is what they refer to as a post-mortem diagnosis at this point. Most neurodegenerative diseases are confirmed post-mortem. So after we die, then they can go into the brain cross-section it and look at it under a microscope and it looks differently under the microscope than it should. So this is what she's seen, the severe stage of CT in the majority of the retired football players that she's, um, that she's dealt with. So again, normal brain, signs of CT. Mild CT, here you can see in this section, this is severe CT. So you can see all of this tau protein. So in this recent study, 
they basically said in total 223 of the 266 participants met neuropathological diagnostic criteria for CTE. More years of football played were associated with having CTE per year played. So basically the odds ratio, let me see here, as this always pops up at the bottom of the screen, the odds ratio doubled every 2.6 years of football played, which is highly significant. So your odds of developing chronic traumatic encephalopathy doubles every 2.6 years of football played. And I'll show you other studies where they looked at, you know, basically people who play football for 12 years with at least two years of professional football experience. And we see changes in their brain for sure compared to those who have not played. So in essence, the more subconcussive head impacts, even without having concussion, when your head is used as a battering ram repeatedly, the brain shakes in the skull, and that seems to be associated with this hyperphosphorylation of tau process known as CTE, which then goes to the perivascular areas, areas in the sulcal depths. And let me see here. I don't think it's labeled here, but in essence, uh, I may have it in a different slide. In this group of 266 participants, you know, Dr. McKee is looking at, you know, other combat sport athletes. She's looking at uh, veterans who have had blast injuries. And I think it was notable that it's somewhere around 110 out of 111 former NFL football players that she has evaluated have had CTE. So 110 out of 111 have had CTE. I think it was three out of 14 high school players and then the college athletes, it was somewhere in between uh, that. I don't, I don't remember if it was around 50% or something of that nature. But in essence, it seems like she's seeing a high rate of CTE in these individuals who have played professional sports with head injuries and who are having symptoms. So here, let's just kind of review it. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a neurodegenerative disease associated with exposure to contact and collision sports, including American football, boxing, association, association football, which is soccer, rugby, and ice hockey. So this is not just a matter of American football. I'm not trying to, um, you know, belittle American football at all. This isn't, this is a global issue. There are now questions being raised, should kids be allowed to head the ball, so to speak, before the age of 18? Should you know, hockey players be allowed to be you know, violent, having collisions before the age of 18? Again, Dr. Mull's work is changing our framework for what it's like to play sports at a younger age and probably for a good thing, for our children's health. And his argument is that after the age of 18, <clears throat> that you can make the decision yourself but before the age of 18 are you do you have the neurological competency so to speak to make the decision whether or not you want to engage in combat sports or football or hockey or heading a soccer ball not really fully understanding what this may mean to your life in the long run probably just why you know you have to be a certain age to buy cigarettes you have to be a certain age to buy alcohol so the pathognomonic lesion of cte as the perivascular accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau and neurons and astrocytes in an irregular pattern most prominent in the depths of the cortical sulci. Clinically, impulsivity, explosivity, depression, memory impairment, and executive dysfunction most commonly occur in CTE. Among 202 American football players from the Veterans Affairs, Boston University, Concussion Legacy Foundation, BrainBake, 177 players had CTE. So 177 out of 202 including three of 14 high school players and 48 of 53 college players. So I was wrong. It's 91%. It's not 50%. So these numbers are staggering in 110 out of 111 National Football League players. So first of all, three out of 14 high school athletes, that's a low percentage, 21%, but still you're seeing CTE in high school athletes. That's very disturbing. And then 91% of college football players. And 110 out of 111 subjects who are formal, former national football players. So these numbers are pretty scary when you actually really look at them. And so this speaks to what can we do to help brain health, neurological health for those who've sustained repetitive head impacts. 
And that's the question. And I don't have a definitive answer for you <clears throat> at this point in time in 2020, but I have theories. And that if you go back and watch the concussion and the gastrointestinal broadcast that I did, where they're showing that the gastrointestinal breaks, gastrointestinal tract breaks down almost immediately after head injuries and disturbances and gut bacteria can really affect the brain and how we accumulate inflammatory proteins in the brain. And so this is raising a question, can we do something, maybe dietarily, can we do something supplement-wise? Can we do something from an anti-inflammatory aspect that will maybe help to slow down this process CT? That's the thought. I can't say that that is the case. I can't say that that is the conclusion, but that is the hypothesis. At least that I'm working with at this point in time. Now, this study, Lasting Consequences of Concussion on the Aging Brain, findings from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. This is from NeuroImage, I believe in 2019 or 2020. This is a cool study because they looked at individuals who had concussion. So not as much repetitive head impacts or subconcussive head impacts, but they looked at individuals who had had a concussion versus those who had not had a concussion. They compared one group to the other group. So you had 51 participants um, basically who had had a concussion in their medical history, 150 participants with no history of concussion. Basically, they saw that those with concussion uh, had greater atrophy in the temporal lobe, white matter, and hippocampus at first imaging visit. Again, the hippocampus is your memory area. Those with prior concussion also showed differences in white matter microstructure using DTI, including increased radial, radial and axial diffusivity in the fornix, stride terminalis, anterior coronaradiata, and superior longitudinal fasciculus. Those are all big words, basically meaning white matter tracts are running through different parts of the brain and connecting to temporal lobes to the frontal lobes and things like that. So just with a history of concussion, not necessarily repetitive head impacts, we're seeing long-term changes in the brain. So they said the, these results also suggest that many of the reported short-term effects of concussion may still be apparent later in life. And here's their DTI imaging of the temporal lobes. And this is one of my favorite articles too, because again, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a post-mortem diagnosis. So let's say you're a military veteran and you've been exposed to several blast injuries and your spouse notices that you're acting differently and now you have impulsivity in a way you didn't used to and you're becoming angry much more easier than you used to and you're feeling more depressed than you used to and you may have the question, do I have CTE? Or maybe you're a retired professional football player or maybe you played college football or maybe you were a boxer. And so the question is, well, do I have something going on now? And I would say one of the best things in terms of the most cost effective and best things you can do to hypothetically evaluate that would be to get a volumetric MRI. A volumetric MRI looks at the density of different areas of the brain. And so with a volumetric MRI, we can compare your density in every area of the brain compared to age match normals. In fact, the, Na the National Institute of Health, sorry, I have an ear popping going on. The National Institute of Health has a data bank, I think it's of around 3,000 people for every age group of what you know the standard brain should be in terms of density for those who haven't had trauma. And so we can then compare that to basically we can compare somebody who's had in, head injuries to someone who has not had head injuries. And so this is an image of a volumetric MRI of the cingulate gyrus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. And they in essence showed that in these retired professional football players that there were reduced volumes of the limbic system structures and former NFL football players are associated with neurocognitive features of CTE. Volume reductions in the amygdala, which is your fear center, hippocampus, memory area, and cingulate gyrus, that's your emotional processing area, may be potential biomarkers of neurodegeneration and those at risk for CTE. So that's where volumetric MRI is so cool, and that's where volumetric MRI is taking off for conditions like Alzheimer's disease, because we can see, hey, you know, your mom has Alzheimer's, 
does it look like your memory area is shrinking? Now we can start to employ the same type of imaging, which is different from your standard brain MRI. Your standard brain MRI is just looking at, you know, for tumors, strokes, signs of MS, things like that. This volumetric MRI looks different when you look at the images and it gives you a different percentile reading saying, hey, you're losing density in your emotional processing area. Maybe we need to do something about this. Let's look at this. Um, so that's my perspective again and my hypothesis, but that would at least give you a baseline um, to work from. Again, I'm not treating you, you're not my patient, but I'm just trying to give all of you the information in the most current format so that you can make good decisions for yourself and your brain health. So yeah, so that's it. So that's the, that's the talk on chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's a pretty involved topic and sometimes trying to distill down the nuances to make it palatable is not always so easy, but I hope you found this helpful. Um, go ahead and like this video, subscribe, and let us know your thoughts or questions. And let me just check Facebook to see if there's anything else going on. Let me see here. And good morning to all those who joined, and happy weekend to all of you. And I will see you later. Okay.